number 25, uh, Thomas Aquinas. He turns out to be super important, actually. He's definitely, other than Jesus, he's the most important, certainly, Christian thinker, most influential. And all philosophy after him for hundreds of years was either an affirmation of him, and then after a few hundred years it was an attack on him. But you couldn't ignore him. So, extremely important. And I, th I think, what did you notice in common with Aristotle, just off the top? Because obviously he quotes Aristotle a lot. Like, uh, man, like the principle of motion being within us. Did, you know, did that kind of ring a bell from Aristotle? The, all the free will, the choice stuff, uh, having goals, the happiness being a big deal. This is like a Christian Aristotle, basically. And so God plays more of a role here than it does in Aristotle. And so that's a big difference. But I think that a lot of the stuff that Thomas Aquinas says, it's known for being a little bit tedious. And he's highly deductive. So deduction is like if A then B, if B then C, therefore A then C. He's constantly moving terms around and saying, well, because this, that, and if this, that, the other thing, therefore the other thing. And so it becomes this like maze of logic. And people eventually made fun of it and said it. Well, it seemed like he was arguing about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. It became really fine spun and obscure. And so I think, especially for us today, it's important that he does manage to keep it to real life examples. And I thought one of the real life examples he used was interesting. He said, we may remain ignorant of some circumstance of our act and do something we would not do if we knew that circumstance. For instance, we may not know that someone comes along the road, so we shoot an arrow and kill this passersby. In that case, through ignorance, we kill the passerby involuntarily. So he's constantly making distinctions and because of that, because of all this analytical rigor, it does become somewhat taxing. But I think it's good for your brain to read Thomas, but it's not easy. Now let's go to the nature of choice, because he sides with Aristotle on this business of what choice is. Is it thinking or is it feeling? And Thomas says that it's both. And we remember that Aristotle said it's both. Thomas says, now two things concur when we choose, our mind and our heart, our thinking and our feeling each play a role. For just as an animal seems composed of soul and body, neither a mere body nor a mere soul, so it seems with choice. So he's basically saying that when you choose to act, it involves your, your mind and your body somehow come together. And so what's that muscle connecting mind and body? Because they're totally separate. Now, this becomes a huge problem in philosophy because nobody has been able to figure out how this happens. Not the brain scientists, not the philosophers. So Thomas and Aristotle think, well, it just happens. Well, yes, but we don't understand. How can you tell yourself to do something and then do something? And then can you, like, disobey yourself? And then there's all these interesting questions. Can you actually wish to make yourself unhappy? And Thomas says you can't. But I wonder about that, and I wonder about a lot of these things. Anyway, back to this business of what it is when we choose. Thomas quotes Aristotle. He says, Aristotle remains unsure whether choice belongs more to thinking or to feeling. He calls choice either a feeling thought or a thinking feeling. But he tips the scales toward thinking feeling, causing choice, a desire proceeding from thought. So you have this thought, and then it gives you a desire, and then that becomes your choice which I guess makes sense, but you can't really see it, uh, taste it, smell it, or touch it. So anyway, he makes this interesting point that all human action is voluntary because all human action is rational. And because all human acts involve reason, we can call all human acts voluntary. So you see how it's all about logic. But he makes this very interesting logical move to get out of some difficulties. <laughs> Under goals... He says, we call those actions human, which proceed from a deliberate will. Any other actions we can call actions of a person, but not of a human. For we cannot call all them proper to man as man. Now, that seems funny. Like, if you do something that's not rational, you could say, well, you're acting as a person, but not as a human. And the stuff we do from the best thing within us, it, when we're human when we act that way, 
And then when we act in like an ordinary way, we do something like go to the bathroom that just animals do. We're going to the bathroom as a person, but that's not a human thing because that's not particular to man. So laughter would be a human thing, right? Playing jokes would be a human thing. Play, I don't know, because it seems like puppies and intelligent animals play. Anyway, you can see how easily we're led down these blind alleys. And then there's this place where he says, do we choose of necessity or freely? He, he seems to leave the door open for the will not being free in certain ways. And, you know, once you open that door, it's kind of hard to close it. So most philosophers today, in my experience, are, don't think we have free will because they think, oh, well, then your actions are not caused. Thomas says, the will tends to whatever the reason freely apprehends as good. For that reason, we cannot freely will ourselves to do just anything. Reason cannot judge the perfect good of happiness to be an evil. Consequently, man wills happiness necessarily. He cannot will to become unhappy. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think people can will themselves deliberately to become unhappy? And what about, with me, like in psychology, they might say some people, well, they might feel guilty or something. They might say, I don't deserve to be happy. Therefore, I'm going to do stuff that makes myself unhappy, right? They might feel unworthy of happiness. Uh, they might have self-esteem issues. Because certainly, if you look at reality, people are absolute geniuses at making themselves unhappy for no good reason. Maybe that's you know intentional in some way. Maybe it's not accidental. But how would we really know? Okay, so moving on, let's go into this section on goals. And he says that in, in a thing that reminded me of what Jesus said, and this is something that's just come up a lot. It, it, you know, this is like one of these golden sayings of Jesus, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Thomas says, that which we take as our ultimate goal masters our affections, since we take from this goal our entire rule of life. Hence of gluttons, which is people who live to eat, we say they worship their belly. So I guess sometimes I feel like that, I worship my belly. But below that, the under all, do all people have the same ultimate goal? The last paragraph there, he says, those who sin turn from their ultimate goal, but they do not turn away from the intention of the ultimate goal, which they mistakenly seek in other things. So he's saying that even people who sin are trying to be happy, but they're just doing it in the wrong way. They think that something like robbing a bank or stealing a Birkin bag will make them happy or whatever it might be, but they're mistaken. But that seems to contradict something he says before that, when he asks, should we judge acts by their goals? And then he says, yes, Augustine says, as our goals merit blame or praise, so will our deeds. So if your goal is to be happy by stealing a Birkin bag or by robbing a bank or by cheating on a test and that goal is noble of happiness and it's just mistaken, how can you judge the action badly if the goal was good? So to me, that seems to land Thomas in a contradiction there. I don't know. I think the error is in thinking that the intention makes the good act. So this business about can money make you happy? And I've never heard of a philosopher who did think money could make you happy. So that would be obviously awkward if he believed that. Money can't buy you happiness, but I think poverty can definitely make you miserable, for sure. Like if you don't have enough money for health care, you don't have enough money to care for the people you love, and if you don't have enough money to be generous with your friends, which is clearly one of other philosophers say that being generous and helping out your friends is one of the main ways of making you yourself happy, right? So if you don't have enough money to be generous to people, make them happy, that's not good. So, but then he makes this point up above that. He says, we do not live to eat, but eat to live. Therefore, in the order of nature, all such supporting things fall below man and cannot serve as his ultimate goal. So in other words, he's saying, yeah, okay, let's say that money is kind of like eating. It's pleasurable, but you really do it to make other things possible, right? He says, you don't accumulate coins and money it, for itself, you accumulate it so that you can shop or that you can get something that you want. Right? So money's not an end in itself. It's a means to some other end. It's a means to your own happiness. So therefore, you can't say it's good in and of itself. But then he talks about the desire for artificial wealth, and he makes this interesting point that there has no principle of limitation. He says, the desire for artificial wealth becomes infinite. It has no principle of limitation. If getting rich remains the goal, then one can never become rich enough. Thus the Bible says, 
Whoever eats that earthly bread will still hunger. Likewise, Jesus says of material wealth, whoever drinks that water will thirst again. And I think you could say the same thing about power, or this is one of the bones I have to pick with all these social justice warriors or you know, these diversity, equity, and inclusion people. There seems to be no principle of limitation on what they're proposing. When do they stop? When are we equal enough? When are we diverse enough? When are we inclusive enough? And how would you know? So it just seems like an endless claim on other people's resources, an endless claim on other people's guilt or whatever it is. So it seems to have no way of completing itself or ever ending. But could someone say the same thing about happiness? If getting happy remains a goal, then can one ever become happy enough? I don't know. Could you like explode from happiness? Is there any limit to how happy you could be? You could feel like you're just completely content. And I think, you know, we all have moments of that in our life where we're completely content and we want for nothing. And I think that what Aquinas would say is, well, the happiness of the philosopher, where you're contemplating God and seeing the divine essence and becoming one with God, that is a happiness that's so complete that it does have a principle of limitation because it itself is kind of, kind of knowing the infinity of God. And so therefore, there's, not, there's no way you could go beyond that as a, as a human. You've reached the pinnacle and you reach the limit that you can do there. I think that's probably how he'd respond. But I think it's an interesting question. Then let's go to can honor make us happy. And there was an interesting sentence there. He says, the true reward for excellence remains happiness itself, for which the excellent person works. For if he worked for honor, we would not call his work an excellence, but ambition. So the motive is very important. You're doing the same work, but if you're doing it for honor, you're just ambitious. Whereas if you're doing it for happiness, you're excellent. So back to the point I was making before. Can you ever be happy enough? Does happiness have a principle of limitation? Because remember, we were saying wealth doesn't, right? There's no limit on the amount of wealth you could obtain if you set wealth as your goal. And Aquinas says, man cannot become perfectly happy so long as something remains for him to desire and seek. But when he achieves perfect union with God, nothing remains for him to seek or desire. So he would say that's a principle of limitation. It has a way of stopping. When you're in perfect union with God, what else, what else is there to do? So this is why these people become monks or, you know, the, they become rabbis or whatever because they are seeking that perfection of union with God and to them you know that that's that's the path of happiness he agrees with Aristotle that happiness consists in an activity of philosophical rather than of practical thought and he says and he I think this is right out of Aristotle if we deem man's happiness and activity then we must deem it man's highest activity now, man's highest activity pertains to his highest power, pursuing its highest goal. Consequently, happiness consists not in practical deliberation, but in thinking of the highest things. Now, again, he's not saying that practical stuff is bad. He's just saying it's not the highest thing because you do it for something else. So that's kind of how he organizes stuff. I guess you could say he has a hierarchy of values. So this last question, can man attain happiness? Man can have a certain portion of happiness in this life. Man's mind can apprehend the universal and perfect good, and his will can desire it. Man can see God, and perfect happiness consists in that vision. Therefore, man can attain happiness. So, this is a very optimistic outlook on life. You can be happy, you're not just a miserable worm, and the fate of man and the destiny of man is to seek and obtain this happiness, which he can do in this life on this earth. Now that is a huge and revolutionary idea and it leads to the Renaissance because now this earth and this life is being valued. We didn't see that in Augustine. And so now we're starting to see this life, this world, be happy here and now. And that, about 100 years later, we see everyone thinking this and figuring out ways to be happy in this life and using the new freedoms from the Magna Carta and using the new power of the middle class and all the money they have and, and stuff like that. So with that, we start pointing ourselves to Dante, which we'll read on Monday.